Thank you so much. I don't know if you know about Dr. Kimboko's history, but she suffered a stroke about two and a half months ago, and you would never know it. She was beautiful for the way she thought. She was beautiful. Oh, sorry, I've got to come over here. She was beautiful for the way she thought. She was beautiful for the sparkle in her eyes when she talked about something she loved. She was beautiful for her ability to make other people smile, even if she was sad. She wasn't beautiful for something as temporary as her looks. She was beautiful deep down to her soul. F. Scott Fitzgerald. Dr. Kimboko, you are the embodiment of aging with grace and claiming the power of aging. To have hosted this for 19 years is a testimonial to your deep-seated passion. Thank you so much for all that you are. Thank you for that generous introduction, which I wrote for myself. <laughs> and for inviting me to this illustrious event. I'm honored to be here and thrilled to see your personal ongoing commitment. <clears throat> I'd like to thank my daughter, who is 15, for being here today. I pulled her out of school. You're welcome. <laughs> and I'd like to thank my many friends who I only just told about this recently as I completed my speech and was finally satisfied with my, my opportunity. I said, hey, come join me. So if you want to stand, wave, or make some noise, to those of you who are here as friends and colleagues, be they recently made friends or friends uh, I've made in the last 18 years of living in Grand Rapids, uh, a friend of mine is a friend for life. So I hope I get to meet many of you today. In today's talk, I will define ageism. I will highlight the importance of recognizing wisdom so we may offer grace through aging. I will utilize patients' stories to expose ageist principles that negatively impact patient care. And I will highlight the imperative of believing in our approach to redressing the ism of ageism with the hopes that collectively we can make human connections kinder. I think there's a light on this lectern. And it's, if somebody's able to give me a light, that would be great. And if not, that's OK, too. OK. I owe everything I am to my parents who gave me my life. So I shall begin today's dialogue there. The theme of my talk with you today is believed. My parents hail from India. My father, who left this material world six years ago, remains my most influential guru in the art and the science of medicine. Not a day goes by without my invoking dad's charisma and his unwavering affection for medicine. He trained in New Delhi, then came to the United States in 1974. He earned a gastroenterology fellowship at Wayne State University, then went on to practice for over 40 years. He showed my brother and I the value of a purpose-driven life. His own unimaginable list of medical crises and years-long affliction with occupation-induced arthritis and chronic pain would take the better of our father after decades of maneuvering unwieldy endoscopes. We watched dad fall into a spiral of surgical and non-invasive procedures to redress spinal stenosis. And he died at the age of 73 in 2017, working to his dying day because dad's mind had always outpaced his body. Interestingly, Dr. Gupta put away his endoscopes in his early 60s and studied for series seven. He took countless exams in a discipline that was not his own, but he trained his mind to do something else while he gave his body rest. Dad joined New York Life and taught friends and family, clients and strangers about the power for planning for retirement. And his earnings were quickly placed back in the arms of the policyholder because his endeavors were never financially motivated. Rather, they were motivated by his joy of working 
and finding an alternate purpose in his life, guided by his personal principles of service and mentorship. Work gave Papa personal meaning and filled a hollow that pausing his dedication to medicine sorely needed. I remember a younger colleague from New York life of his coming to our home, often simply to spend time with him. And I found it really odd. And I remember sharing that with dad, like, do you trust this guy? Is he coming after your money or trying to hoodwink you? And Papa, who prized himself on being a rather decent judge of character, looked at me and said, Abha, I'm not getting what you're getting. This 40-something-year-old man, whom we will call Richard, simply delighted in being in my father's company, imbibing dad's wisdom, discussing topics spanning worldly matters and basking in my father's countless years of experience dealing with life's struggles and life's triumphs. And I think Richard saw this magnetic physician turned life insurance salesperson as the real deal. And I know that today, being roughly the age Richard was when he sat in dad's wake, that I would have had the exact same yearning for life and wisdom he shared with my venerated father. Because honesty, decency, wisdom, and positivity are qualities we, are, we sorely need. And if we open our eyes and give them our time, we may find these cherished but elusive wisdom and qualities dwelling in the experiences of our elders, whose lives are brimming with hard-won lessons we have yet to have accrued as younger people in their wake. Papa never let age stop him, but I will say with certainty that his age would continue to refine him Time offered him clarity and perspective. It offered him accrual of knowledge, and time offered dad a kind of credibility that youth often cannot. In short, dad could be believed because of his wisdom and because of his purposeful life. I said something just now that I want to circle back to and comment on about a kind of credibility that youth often cannot. While in training in Ann Arbor, I met my husband in 1998. I was an intern and he a fellow studying interventional radiology. We married in 2000 and he left two weeks after our wedding for the island of Oahu to begin a six year payback to the army for his medical training. He worked at Tripler Army Medical Center, a garishly pink hospital nestled in the mountains. I would complete my training and join him a year later to begin at Kaiser Permanente, suffering both sun and surf 4,000 miles from Michigan. <laughs> True story. To say it was difficult would be a lie, so I won't try. <laughs> it was beautiful. I met colleagues of every age and culture and patients of largely Hawaiian and Asian Pacific backgrounds. Many of the people still speak Hawaiian pidgin or Creole a native English dialect, which I would come to pick up with time largely to enhance my own credibility. I stand five foot one, and I was 28 years old when I began my career. I remember I walked into a patient's room whom we will call Rosa. Rosa was in her 60s and newly diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. And I shared what this meant, an abnormal rhythm of the heart for which stroke prevention and rate control would be paramount for her safety. I discussed heparin and warfarin, the preferred treatments 20 years ago, and I talked about rate control with a beta blocker, and I spoke with precision. And Rosa simply stared at me. And then she sighed, and then she disagreed, and then she asked for a second opinion. And I knew what was going on, and I knew what I had to do. So I called an older man to the rescue. My colleague was a retired military hematologist working as a civilian doctor at Kaiser. He had golden hair, a southern drawl, and wore rimless reading glasses perched at the edge of his nose. He went in and he discussed the imperative of heparin, warfarin, and rate control. And imagine. Rosa believed him. 
And then my colleague came out of the room and offered me some tips on how to discuss sensitive medical diagnoses with patients. And I smiled. And I don't remember asking if I could maybe borrow his readers or his age or his gender for that matter. (laughs) But I could see and even appreciate that my age would not allow me to be believed. Not yet. A month later, as Rosa was being discharged from the hospital, I saw her once more. And she wheeled her way toward me, and she said, I owe you an apology. You are too young to be a doctor, and I know that is why I did not believe you or what you had to tell me that day, and I am sorry. We're talking about ageism today, and many of you probably appropriately assume that ageism is the application of age-based bias towards older individuals. And though the term was coined poignantly in 1969 by Dr. Robert Butler, a psychiatrist shining a light on prejudices toward older individuals in the housing market of Washington, DC, today, I would ask you to stretch our collective understanding of ageism. While I also believe that the ageist dialogue concerns the misappropriation of pejorative stereotypes toward older people, let us not forget that biases span the spectrum of ages, and we will all experience this in our lives, no matter our chronological age. Ageism is the misappropriation of bias toward any age. I have been a physician for 23 years and counting. I am a storyteller. My life's work has been about patient care interactions that have spanned four years of medical school training, three years of residency, five years in Honolulu as a hospitalist, 10 years at Spectrum Health as an inpatient or acute care physician, before changing careers to practice internal medicine and primary care at Cherry Health for the underserved for the past seven years and counting. This recent phase of my career without a doubt, has been a highlight of my life, my life's work to date. Without a doubt, the catalyst behind my passions can be attributed to a singular source, my patient's stories. And I am forever indebted to the countless patient interactions I have had, over 60,000 and counting. From these individuals who have opened their wounds and their hearts to me over these last two decades, offering me pause, reflection, tears, and humility, and arming me with important real life lessons for this talk today. A decade or more ago, while working as a hospitalist at Spectrum, I met Robert, a professor at a local university. As a disclaimer, none of the images you will see today are those of my actual patients. He was admitted for urosepsis, and he required IV antibiotics, IV fluids, imaging, and inpatient care. I remember it being a Sunday when the activity on the ward was quieter. Robert had a room with a large window, but the sun was not shining that day. I entered, and with his permission, I turned off the blinding overhead lights, which to me always felt more like an interrogation, less intimate and difficult for meaningful dialogue. I pulled up a chair and I sat down beside him. I already knew about his labs and the documented reason for his admission, but I knew nothing about him. How are you? I asked, and this story stands out for a reason. I saw a 70-something man lying in bed in a room by himself, and I watched him weep. He talked about his impending accolade. He would be honored with Professor Emeritus status, and he should have been overjoyed. Instead, he lamented his life's choices, his dependence on his career and on alcohol, his distance as a father to his three children, how he wished he had been a better father to them in their youth, when his ambition had driven him toward career and away from family. On my visit with him, time had afforded him a lens that now measured different data points. 
and winning the ultimate star in his career did not shine so bright. Would he be believed by his family were he to share his remorse? Was it too late to see this grown man, older than my father at the time, share the depths of his remorse and to reveal such pain with unbridled candor to me, a doctor 30 years younger than he, felt nothing short of an honor. My age, my gender, my race, none of that mattered. None of them were an impasse to an incredibly emotional and cathartic dialogue with this wise gentleman who had released decades of pent up pain with me one fine Sunday. Wisdom is a characteristic or attribute often ascribed to people who are older. A younger individual who shows such glimmers of wisdom is often regarded as wise beyond their years. An illustration that wisdom is somehow a trait to be accrued with age and refined with time. To believe, however, that wisdom is synonymous with getting older would be a fallacy because not all people who age necessarily gain wisdom, present company excluded. Robert was wise. His candor, his emotional availability, his many life experiences, and his willingness to reflect on his life's choices are the very pillars of wisdom. I recently asked two of my children how they would describe older people. My daughter, who is 15, said wise, kind, and capable. My older son, who is 20, when asked separately, shared the same, all positive inflections of what it means to be older. How we regard people as they age has consequential outcomes on their physical, emotional, and psychological well-beings. Positive belief systems that credit older people as wise benefit them physically and psychologically. Dr. Becca Levy, a researcher at Yale, who is also a University of Michigan undergraduate, has spent her life's work studying and demonstrating this very concept. Older people were divided into two groups and poised to do the exact same task. One group was shown words that were positive and uplifting, while another negative words and demeaning. One group saw such words as capable, strong, and wise, while the other group saw such words as rickety, decrepit, and old. The group that saw the positive set of words performed more adeptly at the task than the group who had been shown the more pejorative set. Similarly, young people who watched a screen flash with positive versus more negative descriptives of older people and then asked to recount stories of the aged were more apt to be persuaded by the words they had been shown. There is a profound power of persuasion where our beliefs are concerned. Valuations of a person based on age and qualities ascribed to them can be harmful not merely in their delivery, but also in their outcome. When we see our elders in a positive light, we witness their creativity, their vigor, their true capacity, unhindered by age. And when we respect them and regard their voices as valuable, we are more inclined to protect them. Words and depictions matter. Valuations matter. Older individuals matter. I joined Cherry Health in 2017 when I changed my focus from acute care medicine to the practice of primary care. And I had the immense fortune of inheriting Lois from a retiring colleague. I can tell you that though she was not given to me personally, she and I would both agree that our patient-physician relationship was preordained. Lois looked like a movie star, an 82-year-old Diane Carroll lookalike with a million watt smile, barely standing five feet tall. She spoke with warm, measured tones imbued with a slight rumble that left you quiet and rapt. She quoted scripture and she left everything to her faith in God and humanity. To this day, she remains an optimist and a lady to the core. 
She suffered from chronic knee and back pain. Under the guidance of her trusted spine specialist, she would receive scheduled injections and she required two Norco tablets daily. She abided by state and federal guidelines. She signed her controlled substance agreements and gave urine drug samples, UDSs, when asked of her. In sum, she was compliant and she was beyond reproach. It should have come as a surprise then when my medical assistant asked me to see if I had checked Lois's most recent UDS. I looked it up and I paused. Red for cocaine glared back at me from the screen. I had to look at it twice. And then I checked the name and then I looked at my assistant and I had no words. After some pause, I called Lois and asked her to come in and see me, which she did without question, because she never questioned me. Ours has always been a relationship founded in trust and steeped in respect. When we sat, I showed her the results, and I watched her face fill with pain and with surprise, and I apologized to her. I apologized for the finding, and I apologized for her pain. And I told her we deserved to figure this out together. I called a toxicologist at the, at the Spectrum Health, something I did not often do. In fact, I didn't know if they were part of a lab, pathology, or another location in the hospital because I rarely needed to call toxicology. But when Dr. Penn and I spoke, I asked him to look at her former data and compare it to the latest findings. And I asked him if the quantitative finding of 50 nanograms per ml was suggestive of direct utilization of the substance or might it, might it be reflective of passive exposure. It had suddenly occurred to me during our conversation that Lois had recently taken in her 50-year-old son who had needed shelter. Her decision had been a source of grave stress and pain for her. Accustomed to her routine, enjoying an impeccable and clean living environment, Lois had had to adjust to dogs and habits far different from her own, and it was causing her anxiety. Dr. Ben verified my talk out loud concerns and stated that the lab had recently changed its thresholds from 150 nanograms to 50 nanograms per ml to capture the vulnerable pediatric population that was being passively passively exposed to cocaine and other drugs. Indeed, passive exposure was not only possible, in this case, it was probable. Dr. Ben told me that had Lois's labs been drawn when the demarcation of positivity was at 150 nanograms per ml, her UDS would have been negative or normal with no measurable cocaine. I called my patient and I shared the findings, and I made the difficult suggestion that her loved one might be engaging in cocaine abuse in her home, close enough to her to be detected in her urine. Another blow to this spiritual woman who had already had to contend with her own false UDS that claimed she had done drugs, now she would have to confront her grown son. My nurse case manager and I discussed this situation and she researched online and found a wipe that could be used to detect cocaine metabolites on surfaces. I asked Lois that if I ordered it for her and sent it to her, would she be agreeable to use it? She was. And she thought about some shared surfaces that may detect cocaine in her home. She remembered that her son had used the kitchen broom to help sweep the floor. So she applied the wipe to its handle and it lit up blue, blue for positive. She would have a meeting with her family and my story must stop there. But not without adding that Lois plaintively asked me to expunge the UDS report from her record. As a spiritual woman, she did not want cocaine, any part of it. My take home message on this painful but important discovery is this. You must protect your patient. You must honor her, trust her, fight for her, and believe her, for she deserves nothing less. 
Well, how old is too old to keep having sex? I know you were falling asleep. I had to change directions. <laughs> Asked at Huffington Post online discussion in 2013, which author of This Chair Rocks, Ashton Applewhite, re replied with, well, we don't ask people when they age out of eating ice cream or singing. We don't quit eating ice cream. Why would we stop making love? Applause. Yes. <laughs> Inaccuracies concerning sex and aging abound. This notion that one is too wrinkled to be attractive or too dry to engage in intercourse or perhaps not sexual are all myths and destructive beliefs that can prevent doctors from identifying serious and treatable infections like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and HIV. While 18 to 24 year olds have the highest rates of sexually transmitted infections or STIs in the US, CDC data from 2020 showed that the percentage of older people with sexually transmitted infections doubled from an average rate of 11.8 per 100,000 in 2013 to 24.5 a mere five years later. And older people are not getting tested because we, the medical community, are not asking the right questions. A recent Kinsey Institute survey shared in Cosmopolitan's magazine's January 2024 issue dished on the realities and statistics surrounding sex in women in the US ages 60 and older. The findings dispute the popular notion that quote, sex uh, dries up the second you become eligible for social security. Women 60 and older remain concerned about lubrication and libido and do not want to submit to natural changes that occur with diminishing estrogen levels. With access to the internet and the latest available treatments, women want to be educated about options for pleasure and sexual gratification. And older people report having more sex than they did before, quote, in part because of confidence and awareness of one's own needs. We cannot ignore the power of the little blue pill. And with the advent of online dating, sites such as eHarmony, Christian Singles, Date My Age, and Elite Singles, dating when older has become easier and more available. Yeah, isn't he handsome? <laughs> the latest bachelor was a widower in his 70s and the impact such inclusion had on this conversation of romance and life after loss in one's older years is noteworthy. When James came to me four years ago, our mutual admiration was founded. He spoke to me, his new doc, with respect and trust. He was roughly 60. I took care of his many health concerns, including hypertension and osteoarthritis. But when James came to me with concerns for an STI, his voice grew quieter and he looked down at the ground in shame. He was embarrassed and he asked me not to look at him differently or poorly for his new concern. Cherry Health is the largest federally qualified health center in the entire state of Michigan. We service more than 50,000 patients some of whom are homeless, uninsured, undocumented, and some are repatriating into society from the prison system. The stories I have heard in my seven years at this clinic would leave most of you in tears. When James spoke of his fears, I looked at this gentleman and I proclaimed, sex is fantastic, and I'm so glad you're having it. I did. Let's get you treated. Let's get your partner treated so you can have as much sex as you want, James. His jaw dropped and he smiled as James does with his eyes. And he thanked me for putting him at ease, for casting no judgment, for understanding him and for dignifying him. I have patients flat out tell me, whatever you put me on, I don't want to lose my sex drive 
or my erectile function. Hypertension afflicts nearly one in three adults in the U.S., and 20% of people may not even know that they harbor the disease, bringing the actual numbers closer to 50%. There are more than half a dozen classes of available blood pressure-lowering medications, and knowing which ones can diminish libido figures into my decision-making. Because if it matters to my patients, then I can and I must consider selections to dignify a patient's desire for retaining sexual function. And the same applies to psychiatric medications. And when my patients come to me with primary complaints of sexual dysfunction, I must consider prescription drugs as a culprit for their symptom, not their age. We must address stigmas about topics that are deemed too taboo or somehow age inappropriate because a failure to do so will foster mistrust, missed diagnoses, missed treatments, heightened morbidity, and even death. And that's all we're gonna say about sex. <laughs> I met John last year. He had no past medical history, and he was coming in for a preoperative assessment prior to cataract surgery. Easy, one might think. John is 66, soft-spoken, a kind smile, and always candid, easy to talk to. I had no labs or data to guide me, but I assured him that the surgery was of such low risk, I did not foresee any barrier to surgery, but we would have to draw labs to be sure. Well, his labs came back, and his glycosylated hemoglobin a three-month reflection of glucose control. I'm sure I have a few diabetics in the audience. His was 10.4%. Normal is below 5.7. John's A1C would suggest an average daily sugar of 250 or higher. Normal is less than 110. I was shocked, and so was he. Well, what do I have to do, he asked. We discussed his history and his daily habits, and I shared important food and calorie data with him. The imperative of reading nutritional labels, I pulled up a label on my own laptop. I showed him the meaning of each line, and I told him how to quantify carbohydrates, sharing that four grams of sugar is equivalent to a full teaspoon, and most sugary sodas pack 10 to 15 teaspoons of sugar per 12 ounce serving. Multiply that by two, three for a two liter bottle of soda. His sugar, his, I knew I would do this. His surgery, not his sugar, his surgery was duly postponed and he returned to my clinic about four months later and his A1C was drawn once more. And with a smile, I could say, you're going to surgery. It was 6.4%. What did you do? I asked him. I listened, and I changed. I changed my habits, and I changed my outlook. I read labels, and I know what contains sugar, and I know how much, and I don't want it, not anymore. He went on to tell me about his reliance on energy drinks, to get him through his shift. At age 66, John had come out of retirement. He wanted to keep active, and to keep pace with his younger coworkers, John resorted to sugar and caffeine to stay awake and gainful. But he realized that those generous calories were driving his sugars, and John made a choice for the sake of his life and the sake of his longevity. John's story is relevant to this discussion today as it applies to elders in the workforce. Right, Steve? Yeah. Becca Levy speaks of the encore career. While people dream about retirement as a liberation from the workforce, now it is the freedom to work at any age that brings people back in. And to believe that a lack of creativity Industry, stamina, or interest are keeping people back is simply false. John is proof that his age did not limit his entry into labor. 
But his own notion that he might need energy drinks to compete or survive did require redress. My father learned a completely new vernacular when he put away his stethoscope at the age of 60. And my friend, Dr. Mary, came out of retirement to round out her 30 plus years as an internist when she arrived at Cherry Health at the age of 70. The number of Americans ages 65 and older is projected to increase from 58 million to in 2022 to 82 million in 2050, a 47% increase driven by the baby, baby boomer generation born between 1946 and 1964. And the 65 and older age group's share of the total population is projected to rise from 17% to 23%. Recognizing this inevitable growth in our older population, especially as the fertility rate is on the decline, will demand adjustment to the designation of retirement, roles for older people in the workplace, and our personal notion of an expiration date. Quote, a recent Harvard Business School study at a BMW plant in Germany demonstrate that age-integrated assembly line work increased productivity, decreased absenteeism, and led to fewer car defects. It's true, young people are in a hurry. Age is a chronological and biological inevitability not to be confused with death. Ageism, racism, sexism, and any ism that would criticize a person for attempting a swim from Cuba, applying for an encore career, or indulging in sex after 50 is the very definition of ageist bias. Aging is a biological process that is inevitable. Sorry, Diviana. We will all age. To believe that aging should be synonymous with irrelevance or incapacitation or even death robs every individual who holds on to such biases of the opportunity to both age with grace and to recognize the grace within each age. My husband and I took our three young adult children out for holiday dinner. I met a woman in the powder room. She was taking a selfie in the floor to ceiling mirror propped against the wall. She was in her 20s and she was celebrating her husband's birthday. We talked and we shared our ages. And she said, well, you look great for your age. <laughs> I wasn't smiling. <laughs> I did, I smiled for lack of any better response to that at that moment. And then I came back to the table and I shared this exchange with my children and they all laughed out loud. Aha, mom, you're old. <laughs> you look good for your age. And I'm going to be honest, I was really irritated. <laughs> and at the time, I didn't know how to respond to this younger woman who was just trying to be polite and fill space with a comment. It wasn't until I gave it some time to think did I realize that I should have said, you look great for your age too. <laughs> <laughs> when I describe my patients in detail and pepper in such descriptives as a model or a megawatt smile, I do not wish to suggest that their beauty or beam somehow make them more beautiful, more interesting, or healthy. Because I'm aware that the basis of their beauty has everything to do with their attitudes towards health. Is that right, Deborah? Is Deborah here? My mom was 71 years old when my father died, and she spent the better part of the preceding decade caring for her husband. She put away her own needs and health on hold for what my father might need. He was in and out of surgeries and hospitalized for unimaginable complications. Mom called 911 more than once and sat by his bedside for innumerable hours, days, or weeks spanning years. 
When she was offered invitations to parties or events, she would never attend if dad could not join her. She always considered his health and his feelings. And to those who knew her, know her or knew my dad, they would say the same. And quite obviously in the process of caring for dad, mom was neglecting herself. I remember calling her dear friend one day and I said, Auntie, dad's health is so uncertain and one day he will pass and mom will have to learn to live for herself, by herself. Would you start going for walks with her, maybe twice a week and get her in the habit well before he dies so she has something to do to keep doing for herself after he is gone? My mom was in her late 60s and auntie and mom did just that nearly three years before dad passed. And per my request, auntie never told my mom that I had asked her to do this. I wanted mom to do this for mom, not for me. So she would derive what was ultimately good for her, for her own health. So she could see the importance of connectivity, of having and holding loving friendships and for the imperative of loving oneself while still loving her husband of 47 years. Today, mom, who was never a technophile, wears an Apple watch. <laughs> she checks her blood pressure daily. She keeps Bluetooth uploads of her data. <laughs> How did she figure that one out? <laughs> she works out at her gym four times a week and has incorporated strength training alongside her cherished water aerobics. She turned 77 this year and gleefully shared, I can sit on the floor without pain and I can get up without assistance. She is, she is at her best level of fitness and she feels a kind of vitality and strength she can take personal pride in. Her motivation, she doesn't wanna rely on us. Not so long as I can take care of myself, she says. She lives in the home she and Papa built over 40 years ago. She plays bridge on the computer regularly, invites friends for homemade feasts as she is a superlative cook. She takes care of her friends in times of need and as the oldest of five siblings, she is the one they all call when they need help. She's always smiling, never has a negative word to say about anybody. She is patient, she is kind, she is active and she is resilient. Researchers resoundingly agree that what determines longevity or wards off dementia is not genetics alone. Genes account for 25% of the aging process. The remaining 75% are attitudes, our mindsets and our approach to life and living. It is our attention to behaviors and practices that are healthy. Becca Levy made headlines in 2022 and appeared before Congress when her groundbreaking research showed that positivity and optimistic outlooks can add seven and a half years of life on average. You stole my thunder, Steve. While negativity can detract about the same from one's longevity, imagine that adding or subtracting seven and a half years to the length of your life simply in the way that you believe. My patients are so very fearful of dementia and they always ask me what they can do to prevent it. And I rarely reach for prescriptions that do not work. Instead, I smile at a partner if they have one sitting by their side and I remind them of how important loving relationships are in the prevention of dementia and in longevity. And that goes for a friend or a significant other. A Harvard longitudinal study spanning, eight, spanning 80 years and counting follows the lives of graduates from the class of 1939. And it found that the single most enduring characteristic of longevity is loving relationships. This is from the Grant study. I tell my patients to embrace life, to go for walks, 
to exercise at their capacity and strength, to laugh, to dance, read, play word games, to stay connected. I invite them to find beauty and joy in their daily lives, walking in the sunshine, laughing with a friend, playing games, sleeping, and taking rest. We talk about meditation, and I play the Calm app. I ask them to abandon derogatory phrases like a senior moment, which is nothing short of a misapplied term to a lapse in memory we will all experience on the daily. When we associate aging with loss of memory, function, purpose, we have already succumbed mentally before any serious or consequential decline has occurred physically. In truth, more people are afraid of getting dementia than are actually incapacitated by it. Only 2.3% of Americans live in nursing homes, 2.3%, and only 13% quali qualify as having dementia. A far greater percentage have mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, and can live independently I have sent more than a few patients for neuropsychological and cognitive testing only for the in tests to indicate that they have MCI or mild impairment. Coming to grips that we will all age, giving ourselves to, to accept this inevitability without imbuing it with negative associations is the only prescription I would have society embrace. No drugs. Resilience, resolve, resourcefulness are three R's a New York Times columnist, Jane Brody, once wrote about. We know that there is more to genetics than genetics to living long and fulfilling lives. It is about maintaining a positive approach to life, following guidelines that include eight hours of sleep, a Mediterranean diet, aerobics, and weight training because health and wellness do not stop after 30. Walking is free, and many health insurers recognize the benefits of gym memberships for their retirement age clients. Statements such as, I'm too old for that, I can't, I'm tired, are not excuses or statements I readily accept. And I no longer consider saying things like, you look great for your age. Instead, I opt for, you look amazing, or even better, you look so healthy. Equating beauty with health may not be as complimentary as we intend it to, and believing that beauty by societal standards is a de designation that people want to strive for can be both demoralizing and presumptuous. Ashton Applewhite wrote, like racism and sexism, ageism is not about how we look. It is about what people in power want our appearance to mean. Think about that. My friend Anne, when complimented by me for her beauty, will muse something like, yeah, right, with all these wrinkles. But Anne is beautiful. The anti-aging industry has led the way in insulting the very wrinkles that most people who are aging would define as their life's story, their joy lines. Suggesting that age is something to be erased or un undone is neither honest nor possible. My friendships span every single decade. I am who I am today for the women in my life of every age who have shown me what grace, beauty, kindness, knowledge, wealth, and authenticity can look like. And it is neither an age nor a wealth bracket. It is neither easily won, nor is it a guarantee. For true beauty is health. Health is honesty. Honesty is freedom. The freedom to approach a job, a lab result, a doctor, a loss, one's entire life at any age without fear of rejection. We should all approach life and aging with the knowledge 
that we will all be heard and we will all be believed. Thank you. Thank you. This beautiful PowerPoint presentation is entirely due to my friend, my medical assistant, my sister, she could be my daughter. <laughs> she uh, got in a car accident this morning. She was rear-ended while driving her three-year-old daughter to daycare. And she called me from the road and said what she told me. And I'm sitting there getting my hair done. And I'm like, well, get your ass over here. No, I, don't, I don't think I said that. I said, you take care of you. You take care of your little girl. And I hope you can be here. Lee, stand up, please. So then I did what I do, which is not, not do it myself. I called another lifeline. And Lee, who's been my girlfriend for a decade, said, tell me what you need. I'm on it. Let's go. We cannot operate in society believing that we can do it by ourselves or that we should even have to. Please understand the power of relationships. Longevity requires it. We need each other. Thank you. Thank you. Great. I don't see anybody rushing up here, so I open the floor to discussion. If anybody has a question, has a comment, a criticism, uh, I'm, I welcome all of it. And certainly, if you want to talk out loud, we're all friends now and certainly have known each other for the last 55 minutes or so. But um, yeah. <laughs> I would yes. love your opinion on sleep apnea, CPAP with dementia. You know, I'm not going to be able to say that there's a correlation to my knowledge. I, I, it's not as if I am testing for obstructive sleep apnea uh, uh, in dementia. And there, because really the diagnosis of dementia comes from weight, snoring, daytime somnolence. Uh, uh, I mean, there's quite a few criteria to include um, age, gender, and all of that. Um, to believe somehow that as we get older and for perhaps lose our faculties, um, breathing and obstruction become a part of it, I, I, I would not even go there. Where I would go is this. Um, as I cited with my mom's story, please, if you see somebody as they age becoming less inclined to go out because they're socially isolated, the consequence of that is weight gain. And the consequence of weight gain is shame. I have a patient who is lovely, a gainful artist who chooses not to drink very much water so she doesn't have to get up to go to the bathroom. And she doesn't want to get up to go to the bathroom because of her weight. She's over 250 pounds, and it hurts. And she probably does have sleep apnea. But to have to go to a sleep apnea appointment requires getting in a car and getting there. A lot of my patients might say to me, I'm never going to look like you. And I hear it every day. And it's very frustrating for me because that is not the goal. The goal is health. Reaching for health on the daily is your job. It is. It should be your number one commitment, making time for self. No job is more important than you are. No amount of work and amassing finances for the future speaks to today. So I can't speak to dementia and obstructive sleep apnea. I can only speak to sleep apnea and suggest that health is now, health is accessible, health is a necessity, and accessing it is not only your right, it is your responsibility. Anybody else? Thank you for that question. 
I'm sure some of those stories stood out in your minds, and every single one of those patients is still my patient today. Delivering bad and difficult news has never been easy for me. It remains very difficult after two decades. Um, I do have some of my patients in the audience today, and I'm really grateful um, that people trust me. I think the foundation of anything in our, no matter what you do professionally, is trust and credibility. And I have to tell you, it wasn't easy for me. I'm very short, and being a female, um, and I talked about the Hawaii story. No matter that I was Asian, in an Asian Pacific dominant area, I was still discriminated. And ageism, sexism, a uh, um, uh, racism, isms, homophobia, all isms are social constructs. They are opinions, they are decisions, that are made, and it's these kinds of conferences that allow us to shed a light on the realities of life, which are we are all equal, is the point. So I really hope that that's what you got out of my talk as well. Thank you.